Good morning. This, uh, this morning's readings come from Roman chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, and it's related to our sins. It's titled, Dead to Sin, Alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may be increased? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live with it any longer? Well, don't you know that all of us who were baptised in Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anybody who has died has been freed from sin. This is the word of the Lord. All righty, well, today we're going to continue on in our journey through the letter to the Romans. And uh, it is a complicated book, I, I admit. <laughs> but it is, it's got so many amazing things in it, so many um, unique themes that Paul introduces that really take up things that were only shadows in the Old Testament then become realities in Jesus. Um, but today we're looking at a very interesting section here because what Paul is talking about here with baptism is that baptism is a way in which we find ourselves being united with Christ or identifying with the union that Christ has with us, which is probably a better way of putting it. I'm not going to go into all the details about baptism because I actually preached from this passage about baptism just a few months ago. Doubtless you'll remember that in, in detail. <laughs> it's funny, sometimes I say to someone on you know, Tuesday, I say, remember that, uh, that thing I preached about on Sunday? They said, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that was good, whatever that was. Yeah. And I'll remind them of what it was and they go, oh yeah, 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 I got that, yeah. Anyway, that doesn't happen here. Fortunately, no. No, everyone remembers it. But mind you, having said that, you know, I can't remember what I ate on, for lunch on Wednesday. Actually, I can. It was salmon. <laughs> it was freshly caught. You know, it was still kicking when it was on the filleting table, and it tasted great. But the Wednesday before that, I can't remember. Um, but I'm still glad I had that meal. And the same is true with, we, we, we are fed by the word of God. And you may not remember what I preached last Sunday. I hope you do, but it doesn't really matter if you don't. What matters is that it changes you. And you, know, you are what you eat. Uh, I should be growing gills. <laughs> <laughs> but if you eat the words that come from God's mouth, it will change you. And, and you don't notice the change week by week, but you notice it year by year. And I always think, where would I be if I hadn't been instructed by the words that come from God? I've got a fair idea where I'd be, and it wouldn't be standing right here, I can tell you. And there'd be a lot of other things that would be vastly different and in a negative way for my life. And I'm so glad that God has been gracious to me and that he's let me eat his word. And so let's eat the word of God this morning. Anyway, with that being said, and that's not included in the sermon time, by the way, that was free and it was extra. <laughs> so, so, and we begin now. Right. Um, that's an interesting thing that people make decisions and do things that, have, that drastically affect your life and you've got nothing to do with those decisions. You know, like I, I've been watching the news over the last few months and watching the fortunes of, say, beef cattle farmers. And they've got no say in the decision that the government makes 
or the rhetoric that the government puts out that causes someone to get offended overseas and then they stop buying Australian beef and then you go broke and it had nothing to do with you. Or, oddly enough, those same decisions might mean that the price of beef goes up and you sell it to another country and you make a fortune. Through no fault of your own, you get rich because someone else made a decision. Or, um, you know, if you're a wine grower or grape grower rather in the Barossa Valley and the Chinese government decides they're going to have a little spat, then suddenly you're out of pocket. But who knows? A year from now, some other decision might get made, a new market opens up, a government makes a decision overseas, you've got no say in that decision and it totally transforms your life. And that sort of thing's going on all the time. Um, even on a very small scale, you know, I went to a football game a few years ago at Football Park, park remember Football Park, way back when, and I watched the game between Port Power and Carlton and the friends I was with were Carlton supporters and uh, ardent Carlton supporters, I might add. I don't know why people in South Australia barrack for Melbourne teams, but, you know, no one's perfect. <laughs> and um, anyway, in the dying seconds of the game, Port Power managed to win the game with a rush behind. And uh, suddenly, my life was better. <laughs> and, the, and the car trip on the way home was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, didn't matter, you know, I didn't care what they said or did. And you see, here's the thing though, um, even though I felt good and it provided me with a certain amount of levity and uh, I did nothing to achieve that, not a one thing, not one thing. What did I feel good? What did I do? What, what, did I handball that ball to that guy who got that rush behind? No. Am I a paid up supporter of Port, Port Power? Nope. I'm not a member. I'm just a casual barricker. That's it. My connection to Port Power is tenuous at best. I mean, I'll make more of it when they win than, 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 than I should. And I always enjoy it when, you know, people like uh, our organist is, uh, is here and uh, Port Power beats Adelaide. I mean, it's been a good year for me this year, but a couple of years ago, I'm sure Noel will, will, will remind you that uh, things went, were, were quite, the, quite the reverse. But the point is that I had no say in Port Power's training program or whatever they did, and yet it affected me just because I have this tenuous connection to them. But of course, the deeper the connection, the greater the, the effect. If, if, for instance, I had money on that game, I'm not suggesting that you should put wages on football games. I'm just saying people do that and your skin is in the game and you have a bigger connection, yeah? Um, or, or let's say one of my sons was um, playing for Port Power. Uh, that dream is over for me, but... Because um, once you get it past about 22, football becomes a really hard game. I remember when I was 18, I said, I'm never going to stop playing football. When I was 21, I never played another game. <laughs> but, um, but imagine one of my kids was... Kick that, that, that winning goal. How would I feel then? Yeah, I'd feel very proud. I am proud of my kids for other reasons, you know. But the deeper the connection, the deeper the effect. That's the point. So the level of connection has a more profound effect upon you. And what Paul wants to say to us in, from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 7 today, is that we have an extraordinary and a profound connection with God in Christ, and that what Jesus did, decisions that God the Father made with Jesus the Son, and the things they did 2,000 years ago, has implications on your life where you're sitting right now, in ways that you may not fully appreciate or fully be able to understand, but nonetheless the effect is there. And if, and if Port Power can affect me emotionally, and I'm not, I'm not just a casual barricade, I've got no skin in the game. How much more ought I be affected if what Paul is saying is true, that my connection to God in Christ is a profound one, then it ought to have a massive effect. And what Paul wants to say is, yes, it does. It has a huge effect. Because he says in verse 5, for instance, um, for we have been united with him, that is Christ, for if we have been united with him in death like 
his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So what, what Paul is saying is, you are united with Christ in his death. When Jesus died, he died for you. And he did something to you and for you without your consent or decision. And, and also when he was resurrected, you're also united with him in his resurrection. All right, so well, I like the, actually the King James Version in this particular case is very helpful because it says, um, for we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And the word planted together there is a very literal translation of the word united. Because the word united means something like being um, having two plants that are grown side by side and they become entwined. Um, some years ago, I attempted to remove a plant called a Canidia uh, nigricans. Has anyone ever grown one of those, a vine? It's, it looks a little bit like, um, uh, what's that purple Australian native, that vine that grows over fences and so on? Hardenbergia violacea, that's right. Um, now you would all know Hardenbergia violacea, yeah? <laughs> Beautiful plant, slow growing though. But the, this is actually another Australian plant, Canidia, is incredibly fast growing. And it actually, the one we grew, grew up into a tree, then over to the neighbor's yard and uh, abducted their children. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that whoever wrote um, that book about plants that eat people, <laughs> what's that called again? The Day of the Triffids. The Day of the Triffids was thinking of that plant when they wrote that, that book. Um, it is, is incredibly vigorous. You look it up on, on, on uh, Google and it will tell you it's one of the fastest growing, most vigorous plants you could ever hope to, um, to grow. And in fact, I suggest you don't grow it because if you do, you'll be spending the rest of that plant's life hacking it away at it to try to stop it from invading your house. Um, and unfortunately, this particular vine, which I'd planted under a tree, had grown up through the tree and had wound itself around and dug itself into the bark and was so, was so deeply connected with the tree that as I was trying to get rid of the vine, the only way I could get rid of the vine was to take down the tree. The two had become one. And whatever was true for the vine and whatever the future of the vine was going to be, the tree was going to have to share in that same destiny. And that's actually precisely the word that is used in Greek. It's not... That's not just an illustration of it, that's actually what that word means. United with, grown together or grafted in, and the two have become virtually one thing. And so that's how Paul is, that's the word that Paul uses to describe us being united with Christ. That the life of Christ has been entwined with ours and ours has been in, in, entwined with Christ. So whatever is true for Christ is true for us. That's what he's saying. So that's his concept of being united with Christ. And it's one of the most important ideas that Paul actually introduces in his teaching. For in it, he explains how Christ has made this profound connection with our humanity in becoming a human being. This, this is the whole thing. This is what the incarnation is about. God became a man in Christ. And he entwined himself in our life. He became one of us. And in the same way that someone else can make a decision without my consent that can deeply affect me, Jesus Christ, as a human being, has made a decision and done things for me and to me before I was even born that has a profound effect upon me. And when I recognise that effect, by faith, it can deeply change me. There is, a, you know, there is another side to this in which, by faith, we... We recognise that and take that on board. So, um, so with this in mind, we can understand what Paul is trying to convey when he writes in, uh, that we have been united with Christ in his death, then we'll be united with Christ in his resurrection. In other words, Christ has vicariously taken our place in our death so that we might also join him in his resurrection. All right. Now, the way Paul then wants to to explain this, he uses baptism. He says, you see, don't you understand the effect of baptism? That's what he goes on to say. Don't you understand that baptism is the, is the touchstone? This is the, 
the, the, the place in which you find yourself discovering this connection and being affected by it. Um, if we go back to Romans 6 verse 1, for instance, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? Now, of course, that's a reference to what we looked at last week. He's saying that where sin increases, grace increases all the more. You can never out -sin the grace of God. As you know, you might think you're a pretty good sinner, and some of you are. Some of you need to work on that, but nonetheless, some of you are world-class sinners. But the God, God's grace is even more world-class. God's grace in a, in a race, in a foot race with your sin, is always going to run you down and beat you by a mile. So, um, so, and so some people were saying, well, if that's true, if the more I sin, the more God's grace is displayed, then I should go on sinning all the more and do it with, with aplomb so that God would be even seen to be even more graceful. And he was saying, well, that's a ridiculous way to think. Well, Because people were actually saying that. People were actually saying that that's what Paul was saying. Some people were actually living that out. And he was saying, you haven't understood the first thing about the grace of God if you use the grace of God as a license to do what you like. That means you have completely missed the point. That's, that's his point. And then he wants to say, well, you see, and he give a reason why that would be missing the point. He says, by no means, in verse 2, we are those who have died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? And then he, he, he wants to go on and explain it in more detail. Verse 3, well, don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ were baptised into his death? And that's where he's saying that in baptism, what you are doing is you are identifying with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So in baptism, there is a burial into the water and there is a resurrection. And we go down into the grave and then we come back up out of it. Now, of course, you know, someone's going to say, so does baptism make that real? No, it does not. It's already real in Christ. But baptism is the bit where, by faith, you join that truth. It, it would be like if um, I had a, a long dead um, relative who had left in his will that three generations from now, um, whoever was to be born three generations down was going to inherit a million dollars. Now, that, 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 that will has got nothing to do with my consent or it had nothing to do with my merits or the lack of it. It's just true because someone else made a decision for me and it has implications on my life. Um, this, this is not a true thing, by the way. This is just an illustration. I wish it was true. but <laughs> Anyway, but... At some point, I've got to go to the lawyer's office and sign the paperwork. Now, signing the paperwork isn't... There's no merit in signing the paperwork. But faith is a bit like that. Faith is just signing the paperwork. It's saying, all right, I agree with that. I'm going to get on board and I'm going to, by faith, embrace the truth. Because I could ignore, I could ignore the will of my relative and say no to it and walk away from it and therefore it wouldn't affect me. Now my acceptance or rejection of something that is true doesn't make it true or false. It's like, I like to describe faith as a bit like going outside, like it's a beautiful day, but I could sit inside all day and not enjoy the day or I can go outside and enjoy it, but my going outside doesn't make the day beautiful, it just means I get to enjoy the beauty of the day. And faith doesn't make a thing true, but it becomes true for you. And in baptism, what we are doing is we're signing on the dotted line and saying, all right, I embrace that. It's, it's not like there's any merit in that. It's not like you've done something amazing. No one's going to say, wow, did you see the way he signed that paperwork? Whew. Because the, all the merit is in the giving of the gift. And... and Anyway, Paul wants to say, so when you were baptised, you embraced this truth and it changed you. You, and, and this is one of the things about baptism, and I like to put all the emphasis on baptism is actually the, is the baptism of Jesus himself. Jesus, when he got baptised, why did Jesus have to get baptised? What did, he had a long list of sins he needed to be cleansed of? No, he said in order that all righteousness might be accomplished, I get baptised. And elsewhere he said in his prayer to the Father, 
in John 17, he said, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. In other words, he sets himself aside as a human being for God and that when we are included in him and we embrace his humanity on our behalf vicariously, then we are included in his sanctification. So you don't, you, you don't sanctify yourself in the sense of you can't make yourself right with God, but you embrace the sanctification of Christ and you enter into his and you, you get united to him. And baptism is one of the ways that we do that. Um, and like I said in the message a few months ago, it's a Red Sea event in which you go through a point of no return and it's a little bit, you know, our journey of faith is a little bit like the children of Israel being taken out of Egypt and going to the promised land. There's a, there's a point when you leave, you say no to Pharaoh and you leave. But then comes another point when it gets to the point of no return when you go through the Red Sea. And that's what baptism is. Baptism divides you from the old Pharaoh, from the old Lord. And now you are under a new leadership. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, if you've been united with him in baptism, then you will also share in the resurrection out the other side of the Red Sea, so to speak. And, um, and in baptism, you know, people, I've, I've, I hear all sorts of arguments. What about infant baptism versus adult baptism? Um, do, you, do you believe in infant baptism? I've heard people say to me, not only do I believe in it, I've seen it done. Uh, or some people say, what about immersion versus pouring and all those sort of things. And we get, I think we get a little bit caught up on our side of the equation, so to speak. Um, and, but when I look at scripture, it doesn't seem to matter so much how or when. What really matters is who. And the who is Jesus. Jesus got baptised. And he did it perfectly and he, did, he lived the whole human life perfectly. He redid the human project in himself that Adam was, uh, failed to do, that Israel couldn't do. And now we just say in baptism, whether by immersion or pouring, infant or whatever, we say yes. We're saying yes to something that's already done vicariously on our behalf and without our consent. But baptism and faith nonetheless is still our embrace and we are owning that connection with Jesus. So um, we are baptised into Jesus and through faith we are identifying with the death and the resurrection of Christ. But for Paul, our identification with Jesus through the act of baptism is not merely symbolic. So it's not... I, so many times people take things like communion and Baptism is merely sin. No, no, it's not. In the Christian faith, it's a, baptism is a physical action with a spiritual effect. In baptism, we are sharing by faith. The faith is the, is the thing that makes it true. It's, it's not how much water or when or whatever. It's faith that counts. Because we're trusting in what God has done, not in ourselves. You see, if you're worried about whether you got baptised with enough water. You know, I had one guy, I was a bit pedantic about full immersion at one point. I had one guy who was well into his 80s, he got baptised. I mean, partly his fault for leaving that decision until so late, but... <laughs> he went down into the water and, and the top of his head didn't go under and he started to come back up and I pushed him back down. <laughs> and I almost killed him. <laughs> Would have been an interesting day. Baptism and eternal life, all in the same day. <laughs> But then you see, the, the, then the emphasis is on what I do for God rather than the emphasis in what God has done for me in Christ. And, and the whole emphasis in the New Testament is this is what God has done, therefore have faith. Embrace what God has done. Faith isn't I have done this for God, therefore he loves me. No, God loved me before I began, as we've seen in the last few weeks. God loved me, and while I was his enemy and still sinning, God did these things for me. He made decisions for me vicariously. And then faith recognises the truth of that, signs on the dotted line and says, yes. And it doesn't make it true. It's just embracing what is true, like going outside on a beautiful day. Um, 
You still can say no. You can still say no to it and never experience the, the effect or the affect, both of those things, um, of what God has done for us in Christ. I mean, it's, like a, it's very similar to a, um, a wedding service. We are legally bound to our spouse the moment you get married. Um, and everything that belongs to your spouse also belongs to you as well and vice versa, the moment you get married. Now, people say, it's just a piece of paper. Well, if it's just a piece of paper, why don't you get married? See, it works both ways. You can't use that argument on me. Just a piece of paper, well, there's nothing to be scared of then. Just get married. The reason people don't get married is because they know it's not just a piece of paper. It's, it's, it's something happens. The moment you say those vows, both legally and spiritually, something changes. And I've been living with that change now for something like 37 years. And they've all been happy. <laughs> for better or for worse. In sickness and in health. For richer, for poorer. Something changed when I got married. And um, it doesn't matter how you feel about that. I feel married, I've got to tell you. You can take that whichever way you like. <laughs> But something happened to me when I got married and something happened to me when I got baptised in water. It wasn't just symbolic. As T.F. Torrance explains that baptism, this is how he says, he says that baptism is a divinely given way in which uh, for our participation in what Christ has already done for us. Notice those, all those words are really important. So baptism is a divinely given way for our participation in what Christ has already done for us. Baptism is the sacrament of our incorporation into Christ on the ground of his finished work. And while it is something we are commanded to do, it is not a sacrament of what we do, but of what Christ has done for us. Can you see that? The emphasis is all about the divine side of this. Baptism is not merely our signature on the paperwork that releases Sorry, baptism is merely a signature on the paperwork that releases the gift that has been given in Christ 2,000 years ago. Um, and therefore, Paul goes on to explain, because this is true, it breaks the power and the hold and the hegemony of sin. Um, as he says in verse 6, the body of sin is done away with. And by body there, he means the corporate power. You know, we talk about a corporate body. Well, Paul is using the word body in a similar way here. He's talking about the body, the whole corporate infrastructure and hegemony of sin is overcome in this, in this. This means that the whole power and influence of sin and death is overcome. For the power of sin is taken away because the unpayable debt that has rendered us as slaves, and he uses this word in this, in this passage, we've been slaves and so on, and elsewhere in Romans, he uses this word slavery. You see, in, in the ancient world, most slaves were slaves because they had a debt they couldn't pay. In Australia, if you, if you can't pay your debts, you go broke. And there's certain laws around that. You can't start a business for five years or something like that. And you can't be on a corporate um, uh, board for seven years, whatever. But in ancient world, if you couldn't pay your debts, you became an indentured slave. And then the only way that you could get out of slavery was either you worked for a certain number of years to pay off your debt or someone else could pay it for you. But in this case, we have a slavery to sin and death that we can't pay. The debt is way more than we'll ever pay. But Jesus has come and paid the debt. That, and that's, that's, that's a, just a way of describing what's happening. It's a, a metaphor that Paul uses. One, one of many metaphors, I might add. But he uses this metaphor to say that Jesus has come and settled the debt. And so, um, as we saw last week, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. And what Christ has done is he's come and fulfilled the law. And he has paid the debt and therefore death has no sting in it anymore. Well, you, you all have to pass through death, but the sting is taken out of death. Therefore, the power, the threat... The condemnation of death is undone. And, um, you know, when I was working in a newspaper in Darwin, a story came through one time. Um, 
uh, during an election in which a significant number of people in Northern Territory were fined for not voting. Um, and their excuse for not voting turned out to be an extremely good one. The reason they didn't vote was because they were dead. And somebody had just failed on the paperwork to you know, cancel their names from the roll. Um, that kind of thing happens in the Northern Territory a lot. <laughs> So the fines were obviously obsolete. Now, if the penalty is paid and we're free from the law of sin and death, um, then baptism is like our death certificate and proof of our death and dead men pay no fines and they feel no threats. So what that means is, if that's true, then you're free to live, free to be free. And If you are faced with, another way of just putting this is if, if you've been out, like uh, I was just talking um, to Jim before about how he'd been up in the mid-north and I've just been in the mid-north myself and you should see the crops, they're, they're standing this, this high and they're so dense it's going to be 35 bags to the acre as they say in the old language, that kind of thing. And, uh, but if you're standing in a field like that on a hot summer's day and a fire come, is coming towards you, then you will never outrun that fire. And that fire, the, the flames will be as high as this building because there's so much fuel. Those, that grain just catches fire and it burns fiercely. I've actually seen it. It's terrifying. And, um, and it moves at a, a speed that's astounding. It can get across a, a, a paddock even faster than the wind because it creates its own vortex. And... There, there's, there, there was an old saying that if you ever get yourself into that situation where a fire is coming towards you, don't turn and run. Stand where you are. Um, get your cigarettes and matches out. <laughs> this was the old days. Light a match, drop it at your feet, wait for the fire to move downwind from you, then step into the burnt patch. And when the fire comes, you'll be fine. Because fire can't burn where fire has already burnt. Obviously. And the same is true that death cannot touch someone where death has already come. And Christ's death is our death. Christ has died on our behalf vicariously. He's united, he's united us in his death. But he had never sinned. And so, and there's, you know, we haven't got time to explain that today. But he rose from the dead because he was stronger. And his bond of love to the Father was stronger than the bond-breaking power of death. And if we're, stand, if we're standing in Christ, we're standing in a patch of ground that's already been burnt. And when the fire comes, just like the angel of death, it will pass over you and won't touch you. So the threat is gone away. Does that, does that make sense? I'm using all metaphor and all that. But there's a profound spiritual truth in this, deep down, that means you don't have to be scared of death. Yes, you will die. The fire will pass over you, but you won't be burnt. In the same way that death came to Jesus, but he wasn't found in corruption. And he rose from the dead. And I'm, if you're united with Christ, I'm united with Christ, you're united with Christ in his death, but you're also united with him in his resurrection, which means that sin and temptation cannot bully you with the threat of death anymore. Like I said last week, the more guilty you feel, the more likely you are to do what is wrong. But if your guilt is dealt with, dealt with, then you're free. You're free to be obedient. And we'll look at that next week. But at least know this. You died in Christ, you are risen in Christ, and you are free. Amen.